Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the realm. I'm Gina. I'm Rich. I'm Jenny. And Jenny's joining us today. We've had a nice month long break from recording. So we're back for season two. So I'm really excited to start season two with what we're talking about today. I think um, it might be a little rusty. <laughs> I know. As I was setting everything up tonight, because I actually like had taken down the equipment. So I was cleaning, you know, the everything. We took down the equipment and I was like, man, as I'm setting it back up, I'm like, I feel like I haven't, like, I feel like I don't know what to do right now. You know, we were talking about Talladega Nights, you know, my hands. Your hands are. <laughs> it feels so awkward. I don't know what I'm doing. Right. Um, so anyway, welcome back to season two, everyone. So we're kicking this off uh, here um, with a really great episode today. And then during the month of October, we're going to be doing a single episode every Monday. So, um, And it's going to be with regards to spooky, scary, creepy, everything spooky we can we can find, right? Yep. And then, of course, have our weird weekly news. Uh, so we'll do that through the entire month of October. So for today, I am passing the reins over to uh, Rich to handle. So I'm I'm going to sit back, relax, enjoy the show, ask my questions, and I'll let Rich introduce our guests. So go for it. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. And like Gina said, we got a special edition today. We're going to talk about the secret which I'm not sure how many people know about. Um, myself, I probably learned about it a couple of years back, and this is something that's been out since 1982. I'm just going to give a brief description of what it is before I introduce our guest, and he'll go into a little deeper um, the storyline behind it and what it's all about because he's been digging deep for several years into it, and he's got a lot of good ideas, I think, uh, enough that it's it opened my eyes to a couple things because I I had it in the back of my head probably for years just knowing about it but didn't really think too much about it yeah. or dig too deep into it and then he I realized he kind of pretty much peeled back the onion to the point where he's he's uh he's got it figured out I think and just I, from I'm what you gonna... told me I'm fully vested and I have yeah. to input here is there is another book out called the secret and it's like a uh a motivational they did like a movie right. as well so this is not the manifest right. or destiny secret this is something totally different this would be the secret or the it's it's a it's a treasure hunt so to speak um it ends up being a treasure hunt type of of a uh, book it doesn't it doesn't uh, start off that way it's more about ethnic groups and it, it it's a good read for everyone it, it teaches you teaches you some stuff and I, if you take anything away from it that i and the way i have is it gets people together it gets people out and doing things yeah and if anything if you do if you if you read it and you get sucked in which i guarantee you cannot read this or watch an episode of one of the josh gates uh destination truth whatever on this without getting sucked into it it's it's very it, it's not I find it hard to believe it could be a one and done for somebody. Um, right. It's very interesting, um, especially, you know, in the past with movies coming out like National Treasure mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. Indiana Jones stuff, all that stuff where it, it's always a fantasy of being a treasure hunter and looking for that, looking for something. Um, this Brian Priest, uh, uh, Brian Price, rather, he he brought this out in 1982. Um, he wrote this book and he went around burying some casks in 12 different cities around the country. And I, I would bet to think that to this day, it, Brian did not, Byron didn't think that this was probably still going to be going on today. I mean, back in 1982, I, th I think he probably thought this was going to be one of those uh, quick book things where everybody's going to jump in and do it like the geocaching thing or something like that. And right. everything was going to be found. Well, that's not, that's, as we're going to find out talking to Brian here, uh, that's not the case at all, um, but it is very interesting. And um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our <laughs> guest for today. I've known him for a little bit, pretty much all my life, all his <laughs> life for sure. Uh, it's my brother, Brian. Uh, welcome to the yeah, show, to the uh, realm. Uh, it's great you. having you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. I've been hearing about it for a while, so I'm happy to be on. So what, what can you tell us uh, in your own words or in Byron Price's words 
what is the the goal or what is the main objective when you read this book? What was he trying to get people to to do? Do you do you have an idea of that? Well, his whole idea for the whole treasure hunt, if you read the beginning part of the book, it's more of a fantasy book and there's the fair people and the fair people each come from a different realm and place. Well, all of those fair people um, are a one-to-one with a real immigrant group. So you have, you know, Italian, Jewish, German, Greek, you have all these immigrant groups um, that are the fair people and it tells their story and they're all going to a new world. So it really is a story about immigration and about how this country is a melting pot and it's people from all over the place. And each culture is very unique and interesting and special. And and it's good to learn and be well-rounded about all of those different cultures and history from where you're from and the rest of the country. So his way of getting people to do that He went around in North America and he buried 12 boxes. Each box inside of it is going to have a handmade um, clay cask, which inside of that, there's going to be a corresponding key. It's that key that you need to send in and you're going to get a gem that corresponds to the fair people in the book for each immigrant group. You're going to get that gem and each one is valued at at least a thousand dollars. So when this book came out in 1982, you had a lot of carrots on the end of his stick to get people really excited about this. Unfortunately, it never took off the way I think he anticipated it would. But once you get into each particular treasure, it corresponds to an immigrant group. And then that immigrant group corresponds with a city. We're lucky enough here that we're very close to Milwaukee and there is one in Milwaukee. So when you go down the secret rabbit hole, what makes this one particularly good, unlike DB Cooper, which is another rabbit hole that we can go down. (laughs) But at the end of this rabbit hole, there's actually something there for you. There's something tangible for you to get. Okay. Okay. And that that's, that's real interesting. And that's kind of, kind of the way I, I read it and understand it as well. And I, I think, as I said earlier, I think it's a way to get the groups of people out mm-hmm. to get, get people to do things and get you thinking. And I, I totally forgot about the, uh, the realm of the fair people. I forgot about that part too. Cause it just brings, like you said, kind of a kind mm-hmm. of like science fiction or mystical. Um, aspect. Mystical. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. Good, good term there, Gina. Yeah. Mystical. It kind of brings that, that stuff into it. So even back in 1982, I think that was enough to get people sucked in. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really wish I knew numbers or well, knew even, more people that were involved, you know? Yeah. And even if you think about it, if back in 82, these gemstones are valued at a thousand dollars or more, could mm-hmm. they be valued at, you know, with inflation or with the way we see things now, a thousand dollars back in 1982 is huge. Right. Right. Like that was a big deal. I, the, re- the really interesting thing with that is because it's been so long and they've been out, only three have been found. So it's been so long that all of these treasures have been out there that it's almost the, the value of the stone and all of that is almost secondary to being in such a real small group of people that were able to figure this out and achieve it. And, um, because Josh Gates on Expedition Unknown has kind of resurrected this whole thing. He's almost become the gatekeeper of this game and what people know about this treasure hunt. And for me personally, one of the, I just want to find it. So I get to meet Josh Gates um, <laughs> and, and be able to get the special little pin they've been giving out just so we can always let people know you're in a very small group. So to me, the gem is almost secondary. I was, would rather have the key or the actual cask that it's put right. in because those are a priceless, one of a kind right. art piece that somebody made. And the longer right. that's in the ground, the more impressive that becomes. Well, I have to, I'm going to go to a uh, sidestep this for one second. If you fanboy on Josh Gates really hard, <laughs> I actually 
uh, a friend of mine, um, and I, I won't mention cities or anything out of privacy sake, but a friend of mine managed um, a place that where uh, family members of his actually lived. And so he would go there and visit and work. And so it was my birthday some years back. And so she would always see Josh come down to the office. They chat, say hi. They were, you know, friendly terms. <laughs> So when it was my birthday, he held up a sign that said, happy birthday, Gina. And she sent it to me in a text message. So I'm like one degree away from Josh Gaze. <laughs> <laughs> Color me jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll autograph a picture with him. <laughs> there you go. I when think- I think he's got like three different episodes that are kind of related yeah. to this topic. And he is so excited in all of these episodes to be engaged in it. He gets so much um, mail and interest and, you know, everybody is trying to get his attention to say, I right. think I know where one is. And, and when he's the in these episodes, he's super excited. Yeah, yeah that's like, the thing, the excitement just amazing level. amazing to watch him. I love that guy. The excitement level is just yeah. out of, is, is, is amazing, I think, from, from his, his standpoint and the people that you meet, that he meets that are actually trying to figure this puzzle, the puzzles out and figuring out which, which goes with which, what, which we'll get into what Brian here in a little bit, but um, it's not as simple as just opening a book and it's going to tell you go here. Cause here's where the treasure is. If, if that was the case, it would be, you know, everybody would have been, the, the, we wouldn't be talking about it right now. Cause it would have been done a long time ago. Right. Um, right. So Brian, what, what originally got you interested in the secret and when did you really first hear about it? Was it, was it something that was on TV? Someone tell you about it or, or what, what, what actually got you interested in this? Well, as you know, my love of the eighties, I want it to be 1986 just so everybody understands that, um, (laughs) which it was. So being a child of the eighties and then kind of remembering that, like I I remember seeing the book and seeing what that picture is. And then that just kind of goes away. You hear about it a little bit. It's once Josh Gates did the Josh Gates had the first episode of expedition unknown and it all came back. And I was like, oh, that's what that was. You know, it's something when you're a kid, you see the book all over the place. Maybe you've heard about it, but you don't know the actual details. And seeing that just totally got me back in. And there was a couple of colleagues at work who liked watching Josh Gates. And one of them hadn't known anything about The Secret. So I I did him the honor of explaining it to him (laughs) and we kind of didn't say anything about it. And then that Christmas, he was very angry that it was all my fault. And when I asked what was my fault, he said his wife got him the book for Christmas and now he was hooked in it. (laughs) And it was right after that, that it really turned into a collaboration where he and I really um, were just bouncing ideas off of each other. And then once COVID came around and work kind of changed a little bit with what our day was like, where we could listen to podcasts, we could do a little bit more research, that type of stuff. Almost every day we were coming up with something new. We had packets full of things, printing out pictures. I've, I've watched the beginning of Laverne and Shirley, I don't know how many times, because Milwaukee City Hall is in it and looking at that. It, so there's, you get in very deep, very quickly with other people that kind of get it or are passionate about this type of thing. It really kind of becomes easy to get just enmeshed in it. And you can get real collaborative real quick if you have somebody else that's kind of on the same wavelength as you. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what happened for me and my friend at work is that we really had a lot of good ideas and anytime I had an idea that he didn't like he could tell me um and vice versa and that's actually one of the other byproducts of the secret treasure hunt is it's a really good um exercise on how to not get married to ideas being able to be more open to other people's ideas it like it's a really interesting thing because there's a lot of people I think who are in the treasure hunt they get real connected to their idea almost like a conspiracy theory and then you can't let it go you right. really have to be able to take in other people's things and be able to let something go when it when it doesn't work it's a real fine line to walk but we've right. been able to do that pretty good easily or, or is a little hard for you do you find yourself wavering back and forth from uh being open to some of that stuff or 
are you pretty much set in your ways with some of the things you you found now i know personally um by talking to you and um jake um my son actually who's involved in this a little bit too won't go too too much into that with him since he's not here but i know he's helped quite a bit since just in a short period of time when you get more eyes and and more brain power involved i think that might that might help a little bit, but sometimes everybody brings a different theory or a different way of looking at it. Is it easy to accept that? Or is it one of those things where as long as there's proof to back up what someone's saying enough to, to, to sway you a different direction? Well, the way that I look at it and what I always say, nobody has found it yet. So if you're going to come up with something, but you can give me some interesting reasons why it works because people you'll, People will stretch and I'll catch myself doing it too, where you really try to make something fit where you want it to. Yeah. It's, o- it's okay to not have everything fit exactly because I don't think the game was designed to be an exact science, but I'm able to, t- if somebody gives me something and I think that it's valid or that they have something really good to back it up, I'll take that. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll chew on that bone and see where that takes you. And sometimes it's something really, really great that makes a lot of sense, but then you find something else that can completely just discredit it. And then you you have to be able to say, well, that didn't pan out or other things that are really great can support what you're doing, but it doesn't, it doesn't make your theory more right just because you have more things supporting it because nobody has found it. So it's all, you really have to be able to distinguish between things that are way out in left field and somebody who can make a very concise solve. If you can give me a solve that you can walk me step by step, I can disagree with it. But if you have all of your reasons, you might be right because nobody's found. I have to ask. So you mentioned that only three were found Mm -hmm. and I apologize. um, How many treasures are there out there? There's 12 total. Okay. Yeah. So Chicago was found first within the first year, maybe a little after it was, uh, the group of friends, they were maybe 13 or 14 and really? they, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they were amazing. the core market of who the book was marketed to. Okay. And, you know, you think the Goonies or any of those types of things right. in the eight, that's kind of the group you're going after or for stranger things fans. That's kind of the group of kids that you're going for with this book. Mm-hmm. And they, did exactly what they should have done is they saw the painting and they said, Hey, that looks like something here. And then they looked at the verse and they were able to just jump off and go. They went outside, they walked the beat of what they thought it was going to be. And they were able to find it. I mean, it's, they, they kind of did it the way that I think Byron Price probably anticipated everybody was going to do it. And then the next one wasn't until 2004 in uh cleveland and that well, that was the greek one by the way chicago was um a te- was uh irish which again was a surprise but maybe we can get into that a little bit down the road um and then the third one was in 2019 in boston was the last one to be found very recent then yes that one was the most recent and with when Josh Gates came out with that episode, it kind of was very close to COVID. So it was at a real weird time where um, you weren't really outside. People weren't going out to parks. People weren't getting together. But yet the the secret treasure hunt kind of took off at that same time exponentially because now people are sitting at home and they have their computer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of work can be done on the computer, but that's not going to get you there until you get feet on the ground where you're looking. We found that out quite recently. Yeah. I I think to to your point there, I think if back in 1982, when, when price was doing this, computers weren't a big thing. So Mm -hmm. you, you, if you were looking like those, the, the the kids in Chicago, they had to look at the book. They had to read it. They had to look at the stuff and then they had to figure out either by walking around town or going to a library, reading a book, stuff like that. You just couldn't go, onto Google and Google a map and you couldn't 
you couldn't do any of that stuff back then. So well, and that would make you think that you should be able to find it now. <laughs> you would think, but I, I and it's back, not that easy. I back mean, to Brian's point earlier, they were though, looking yeah. at a book with a photo or a picture of a picture. They they've when in some of the episodes that I watched, they had like the full blown picture that the artist was available to be able to describe you know, what was with the picture and, and he was kind of guided as to what needed to be in the picture, but he doesn't know where the, where the actual treasures are, which he, he's commented Bullshit. on. <laughs> Bullshit. But, he knows uh, exactly where those treasures are. Don't let him fool you. Don't let him fool you. He knows exactly he because he let the cat out of the bag in the last episode of the Boston one, when he specifically said, here's home plate in the picture. Well, what, who told you anything about home plate in the picture being anything? So he knows exactly where to, don't let him fool you. He knows exactly where the treasures are buried. Well, now and he's going to get Price, more mail. So he said Price he didn't want all the enough. mail. <laughs> Hey, I'm talking, but the, the actual <laughs> paintings are beautiful. There's so much more detailed than what's in the book when, when you, when you when just you got see the book. The real painting, yeah. When you see the yeah. actual yeah. painting, it's really different. It, it's very the, the colors are so vibrant and stuff. It's like you're almost looking at two different pictures, yeah, so to speak. I mean, because it's like, wow, it, it, if you could have that original one to look at when you're doing it, I think maybe it'd be, it might be a little easier because you can see the things a little easier, but I don't know. Um, I do have another question for you, Brian. Um, sure. How how does reading the book? It's actually it's a kind of a three part question. Yeah. How does reading the book and finding what verse goes with each picture help in finding the treasure? And also, do you figure out the picture first or the verse, and then looking at the pictures? Are they confusing on what to look for, or once once you take those steps, does it kind of all fall in and make sense all of a sudden, or is there a difficulty level in each of the puzzles? Well, as far as difficulty in each of the puzzles, the only thing I can go off again is JPP, the painter, on uh, Josh Gates, who has said that they do go with, well, there, there is an order. There is an easiest and there is a hardest. And he said that they have been found in order of uh, difficulty with the easiest first, being Chicago, then Cleveland, then Boston. Now, that's what he said. I personally think he likes playing this game. I, I think he likes giving people a little something to, to gnaw on and then pulling it away. I, I, I think he likes this game because it's his, it was his friend's game that he invented. So he's not, I don't think he's too interested in doing anything that's going to give anything substantial away. So, and, and he should, it, and, he, and he should. Right, exactly. and, and to that, clarify, that, you know. that's the artist, correct? And, yeah. and so just to introduce the thought to the listeners is that, when when you for each treasure for each you know mystery and treasure that you're looking for it's basically presented as a puzzle with pictures and verses from what you said correct and then so it was this person that did all of the artwork for the author um to make the pictures is that what correct okay so for matching up the paintings with the verses that's one of the interesting things about the book is when it came out you had to match them up. There, there is no order to them. So in order to even come up with a city, you had to take a verse, match it with a picture, and find out what city that goes to. So you do you look now, at the, the picture one, first, the verse, or you kind of have to, I mean, what would you do? Would you, would you, being there's 12 verses, do you read every verse and then look at every picture? Or do you kind of, I mean, it, I, I, know, so I don't know that that's how you did it, but how do you think that it, it probably would be done? Well, that's so hard. It's so hard to know how I would do that because the one benefit that we do have today is that if you watch, if you're new to this and you watch the very first episode of Expedition Unknown, they've already done the work for you. I mean, the show didn't do the work to show you what the cities are, but right. fans and the community has done this over the years. So we have the luxury today that if you were to jump in, you know what painting goes with which verse. So okay. it's hard to know how you would have put those two things together. Now, I have an idea about the Milwaukee verse in painting, how you could have put those two together. I can give an example. Milwaukee this, is the one, this is the one we're basically you exactly. know the most about, and this is the one that you're, you're hot on the heels of uh, X marks the spot, so to speak. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, kind of yeah. outline the Milwaukee one for us. 
So what, what makes Milwaukee's interesting is in the painting, there's, there's puzzles and there's pictures and there's things buried inside of the painting that you have to decipher. Some of them are a big clue. Some of them could just be giving you a spot that this is a city. And that's one of those clues that you could use to match them up. So in Milwaukee's is rare because they have a Rebus puzzle inside of the painting. A Rebus puzzle is a puzzle that takes an image, multiple images, and you put the letters or the sound of the word together to get something else. Anybody who's watched Classic Concentration, which I suggest everybody does, it's exactly how that game show worked. You just take a picture. So in the Milwaukee puzzle, in the painting, we have a juggler who's juggling objects. And one of the objects is a millstone. One of the objects is a cane or a walking stick. And one of them is a key. So if you take a millstone, a walking stick, and a key, you have mill, walk, key. So yeah. that one is a little bit more cut and dry once you figure out the Rebus puzzle inside of it. You know that's Milwaukee. Also in the painting, which is why I brought up earlier watching the beginning of Laverne and Shirley, a lot of people, that was a popular show, the side note that this is one of those things, the rabbit hole that you go down with when you really get invested in this, much like Nick Cage and National Treasure, it's very much like that. You will go down separate little holes and the Laverne and Shirley was a particularly funny one when I came back to work saying that I'm pausing it and I'm looking at it because it was a popular show. And in the painting for the Milwaukee puzzle, there is very prominently shown Milwaukee City Hall. So you have a Rebus telling you it's Milwaukee. You have um, what appears to be Milwaukee City Hall. But now we have to find a verse and the verse that goes with it starts with view the three stories of Mitchell. So anybody who would know that a painting is Milwaukee, if you're anywhere in this area, you think of the Mitchell domes, the botanical yeah. domes. Um, there's also Mitchell building. Like there's so many things in Milwaukee that have the name Mitchell in them, which that's one of your connectors to say this verse goes with Milwaukee. Um, there's other things in the verse that also kind of will connect you to it once you start saying, I think it's Milwaukee. And then you go through the verse, you can start finding other things that make you think that. I have one particular theory that I hold on to with uh, Milwaukee City Hall being in the painting. And in our verse, it says, from three who lived there, Milwaukee is the only city in the country to ever have three socialist mayors. So for me, that was something that I connected that if, well, if we have city hall and we're talking about Milwaukee and we have Mitchell and we have three who lived there, I thought that that was an interesting little piece. It might not get you very far, but it helps you connect those verse to that painting. So and the three that lived there, that was before this came out. Oh yes. 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 That was, that was much before. So once you connect that verse and that painting, which again, those little anecdotes, I already knew that the painting went with the verse. So I didn't have to do that work. But once you start, when, when you start jumping into it, you'll start out very basic and you will start seeing those little things and it's still fun to connect them. Um, but what you do learn real quick is you learn a lot about the city that you're investigating to find this treasure because Milwaukee has such a vast history with so many really cool things that I never knew about until doing this puzzle. So we know people generally think Milwaukee's cask is in Lake Park. So when we started doing all of our research, we naturally jumped off from there and we said, here's what they did on the episode of Josh Gates. If you go online most of the information you're going to find about Milwaukee is going to pertain to Lake Park and people with numerous theories of why it's there. And it's entertaining to be sure, but I don't think it's there. So that was doing a lot of our research. We were almost debunking why it would be in Lake Park because it didn't make sense to us. One of the things we didn't mention is some of the rules that go along with the treasure hunt. 
Oh, yes. They're always going to be in a public place. So they're going to be in a public park or garden. They're not going to be ever in a cemetery. They're never going to be on private property. So you have that. It's going to be no more than three feet under the ground buried. So you have that rule. Now there's also an unwritten rule that this whole book is about an immigration story and each cast represents another immigrant group. Like we said, Chicago was Irish, which was interesting because when I think Chicago, I think Italian. We were very surprised to find out why is it Irish? Then you go to Cleveland and there's this Greek. It was found in a cultural garden and one of them was a Greek garden. So that one's kind of on the nose. Then you get to Boston and that was buried at a little league baseball field near home plate. And that's the Italian immigrant group because there's a big um, on the North end of Boston is like little Italy there for them. So circling back to Chicago, why that's interesting that it's Irish and not, uh, and not Italian where the one in Chicago was found was in Grant park. So that kind of perked me up a little bit to say, well, wait a second. I look that up and then I find out that President Grant was, uh, his father was an Irish immigrant. So I thought that that was interesting. Yeah. When I look at the Cleveland puzzle, that's in a Greek garden. That one, again, that's on the nose. There's no yeah. kind of you know mystery about that. When we get to Boston, Lagone Park, is where it was buried in the baseball field. Well, when I look up that name and you get the history, you find out that that person, their father was an Italian immigrant. So I started getting on the case of there being a connection to the park that it's buried at being um, that first generation American from the immigrant group. Um, <laughs> so that was one of the things when we get to Lake Park in Milwaukee, there is no cultural tie to the German immigrant group, which is what Milwaukee's is. So we know that there has to be a tie to, um, to Germany. And Lake Park has no ties to that. So right away, we thought that the Lake Park idea just was null and void because it's not adhering to something that was important in the book. There has to be something with the immigrant culture to go with the place where it's buried. That's the whole objective of the game is for you to learn about those cultures. So each uh, treasure um, labeled with what cultural group or immigrant group that it comes from already. Like, how do we know that Milwaukee is tied to um, German, the, the like the German group? So if we, if we look at the Milwaukee painting, you'll see that the flower on the painting is a primrose flower and the primrose flower is a German flower. Okay. So we know that that is one indicator, but then we also know based off of the gem, each painting will have a gemstone in the painting and that will let you know what immigrant group, okay. because in the beginning of the book, the fair people are bringing their precious treasure with them. So we know in the Milwaukee, it's an amethyst. And we know that that's what the fair people that came from Germany had. So we know that that's the group that we're looking for. Then it's just a matter of connecting that culture with a place which Lake Park doesn't fit, in my opinion. Right. No, that makes total sense. I'm, I feel like I'm on my cousin Vinny and you're on the stand and you're going to, you're, you're answering a question. I'm like, <laughs> wait, wait to hear this. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you sucked me in a few weeks ago. I know. Back. I am completely and best. And all it took was you to say one word to me. And that was, you said, this is how it went. And this is how I explained it to Gina. When I said, we got to have him on okay. because this is amazing. This is how it went. You said, you ever heard of the secret? And I'm like, yeah. How do you know about the secret? And then you told me and you went, what do you think about when you think the first thing about, about Milwaukee, when I say grand and I said grand Avenue and you went exactly. And then you said, Guess what the address is? And I went, okay, I'm listening. From that point on, I knew that Brian and his buddy at work had put enough work into it that they they got it to the point where they know what they're talking. They're not just reading a book and going, ah, I think I know where it's at. They they've been, they've peeled back all these layers. And I think even from 
a couple uh, back in June or whenever that was mm-hmm. July that we, we yep. went through this. I think we've already come to a different conclusion. Oh yeah. From yes. Where you originally thought just by yep. a few of us putting our heads together and going, wait a yep. minute, let's do this. Let's do that. Going up there and walking around. And I think, I mean, you know, that's just the whole part of it is, is just, I think getting everybody together. Cause people don't do that enough these days where people just yep. try to get out and do stuff and, yeah. and, and spend time together. And regardless if you ever find the treasure or find the cask, I mean, this is a story that we're going to be talking about yep. for forever. I mean, this is going to be something that we're always going to talk about. Just like when we go around and whatever we do next with this, we're going to be talking about whether we find anything or not. It's, it's just, it's fun to be a part of. And I really hope we find something because I want to get the tattoo. Because and I want a, I want a video tattoo of, of us finding, of yep. finding one something. of the, one of the guys that was on that actually found one of the uh, treasures. He had been working on this for a very long time. And it was because his kids reached out to him and said, dad, you need to go find this thing. You're a treasure hunter. And he spent so much family time with his kids Um just really getting excited about it and going out and searching for it. And, you know, it was really cool to hear how, you know, his kids were involved in it with him, which just pulls in the different generations too. So I thought it was super cool. That's one of the good things that like I've gotten out of it. I feel the same way is that like, you can tell a lot of people and say, Hey, have you known about this? But when people kind of get it and everybody gets on the same page, it really becomes kind of a, a, a cool group because you're actually working towards something that means something. Right. So when I tell Rich and then, you know, Jake gets involved in it, it's awesome because he's invested in it and he's right. come up with some really, really good things that I hadn't thought about, but you need, you need to have a, a foundation for this treasure hunt, like you almost have to go through and and do some of those uh, really crummy times when you're looking up stuff and you're just getting super frustrated because you get to a roadblock and then yeah. you can find another way around and you start coming up with really good ideas. If you don't have any of that, you can't just jump in and get into it. So seeing other people having Rich and Jake jump into it and kind of absorb all the things that I'm saying and, and taking it and saying that makes a lot of sense or that one, not so much, or here's what we found and being able to do that and get more like-minded people who can do that. It really helps. And that's kind of the situation we found ourselves in now. Right. And I think it's important to point out too, like we were talking about how you mentioned the Goonies and that age, you know, mm-hmm. that, the, that time, that era, and who the book was probably written for originally was that age group. Yeah. And I think what we've, I think that doing things like this, when you're much older than 14 years old, not you, just all of us in general, like, I think that we lose our sense of wonder, wonder mm-hmm. with how we look at the world. And I think that sometimes we make things more complicated on ourselves when we do try to solve puzzles and we do try to look in things because all of our life experience ends up making us think too much. Like we just, we put too, like we overthink things and overanalyze things. And sometimes some of the best, um, I guess, hints are, are so glaring and we're blind to them because we're like, we go down all of these rabbit holes. So having the dynamic of many different people from many different generations and different ages, all like coming together and working on it. I I mean, I think that's cool too, because I think, you know, just to get sentimental a little bit, just as somebody, you know, who forgets what it's like to be a child sometimes or to be a kid, it just kind of brings Mm -hmm. this sense of like, I mean, I watched Goonies for the same reason, just because I love being taken back to the eighties when I was a kid. And just remembering this simpler time when things were just so mysterious and so amazing. And you couldn't just, you literally had to ride your bike over to your friend's house to (laughs) tell them this amazing news. So I don't know. I just, it's very nostalgic. So I love it uh, for that reason. And I think it's probably helpful to the brain too. Mm -hmm. So for like our listeners, if they're, if they're interested in getting started, and learning about this more and actually starting to look for some of these treasures. What, 
what would your recommendation be, Brian, for, for them to get started? I would say take a look at all the paintings, find out what cities are which, and kind of dive into one that you feel like you have a hint of something. Um, no idea is a wrong idea or a bad idea if it hasn't been found. Every, like that, that's one Valid. of the things people have to remember is you might see the St. Augustine one and say, yeah, well, they looked on Josh Gates show and they didn't find it and whatever. And you skip over that. Don't glance over that one, jump into it. Cause it hasn't been found. There might be something that only you can figure out that everybody else is missing. And sometimes it's that little piece that seems to help and kind of opens up the puzzle. So if you want to jump into one, find one that looks interesting or if it's one that has been on Josh Gates before, but just look at it and start looking at history of the place where you're, that you're trying to find it at. I think that's the thing. You can only do so much on a computer, unfortunately, um, but you can learn a lot and it can kind of push you in the right direction. Now out of the 12, have all 12 of them been identified city wise or no? Yes, they have. Okay. I bet I he know. says hi, everybody. She says hi to the podcast. <laughs> we are um, dog friendly here. Cat friendly, <laughs> animal friendly. So all of the cities have been identified. There is one in Canada. Mo Montreal is a location. Let's and go. I speak French. Oh, well, there you go. You should take a look <laughs> at that because you're probably going to understand it a lot more once you get it because there's a, that's another great example of people who live there are going to have a big leg up on that right. i mean that go it sounds silly because you would say wouldn't that work for all the locations yes and no depending on you know wh what place it is but milwaukee is another one of those where i think it really benefits you if you're from here or you know the area or you have a little right. bit of history like Grand Avenue. I get everybody, it, yeah. to go back to Milwaukee's with everybody's Lake Park, they think it's that because in the verse, we have after climbing the Grand 200. And right before that, you have to ascend 92 steps. So people, because there's a grand staircase in Lake Park, and there's uh, 92 steps, which there's not, <laughs> you have to count all the steps, not just the ones you want to make work. Um, <laughs> I can make 92 steps anywhere. Right. You, I mean, you can make, you can make anything fit if you really want to. Yeah. So people say, if you see an aerial view of the grand 200 staircase in Lake park, it looks like the Roman numeral two backward C's to indicate 200. I think that's silly because who's looking at the map to see that in 1982. That's weird. For me, as soon as I saw that and saw the Grand 200, my immediately thought was Grand Avenue Mall. People don't know Wisconsin Avenue was called Grand Avenue. So if you look at a map now, you're not going to see that. If you were from here, you would know there was a place called Grand Avenue Mall and the address was 200 Grand Avenue. So that takes you away from Lake Park. And that's something where, to me, and that's I where I started like, going. Oh my God. Yeah. Right. It's almost irrefutable to still think that it's that staircase. So you have to be able to let go of the Lake park idea and move to other places in the city. Now, while that does, this is one of the maddening things about the treasure is even though to me, I feel like I unlocked a little something with that knowledge of grand Avenue, it doesn't necessarily get you any closer to where you're going. You still have to figure out all the other pieces of it. But what it does do is it eliminates a spot that other people thought it was, which is good because now you can put all your resources into something else. And I think as we've talked before, there's probably more than one way to get to your location. I mean, just because you come up with one thing and someone else comes up with another thing doesn't mean it's not going to get everybody to the same X marks to spot. Um, because I think even the things we've uncovered or mm -hmm. talked about numerous cycles of things have led us back to the same place. So, I mean, just because you think of something like, like you were saying, doesn't mean it's wrong because nobody's found it yet, but you could probably take different routes to get to the same 
there's like three different routes are going to all of a sudden intersect. And that one spot there is where you, where you go from. And it, and if you're reading the verse, you, you got, I mean, it's, it's definitely maddening. Trust me. I know. And to your point of it helps if you're local to the story, I think you have to have boots on the ground. Mm-hmm. Cause I mean, just by mapping it and thinking, you know, where it's at, it does not hold a torch to actually walking it and doing the steps and seeing it and taking pictures or video or whatever of where you're at, because that's might be, that might be where you figure out, wait a minute, wait a minute, this doesn't line up here or wait a minute back up in this, in the verse. Well, there's, there's, there's something right there that makes sense to this. I mean, well, you you can't see that just from a computer screen. Um, so I, I, I agree with you hundred percent on that. If you're in the city that like, if we were going to try to do St. Augustine, it probably wouldn't do us much good. We could probably no. figure out some of the stuff, but without actually being there, it, it's not going to help us um, actually figure out where it's at. Right. You know? Do you know the list of cities? Let me pull them all up. So I'll go with, we know the three that have been found. We have Chicago, Cleveland, and Boston. They've been found. We still have San Francisco, Charleston, South Carolina, Roanoke Island, North Carolina, St. Augustine, Florida, New Orleans, Houston, Texas, Montreal, Canada, Milwaukee, and New York, New York. Those are all the remaining ones that haven't been found yet. And everybody pretty much has, if you go online, you're going to be able to see a verse matched up with painting and gives you the city. And people have done a lot of work to, to do probably the hardest part. And that may be why the book really didn't catch the way he thought is that having to put those things together probably was difficult, especially in 82. Um, Now that people have figured all of that out, I think it does um, not make it a little bit easier, but you have a big chunk of the game already done. Now you can just jump into the city and the verse and start trying to pick it apart. And what you were saying, Rich, when you get your feet on the ground and you walk it, it's a much different thing. I had Zeidler Park circled as a location for a long time. A lot of the things I was going through, it checked a lot of the boxes that I was looking for to be checked. I had a cultural reference. I had an area. I had all these things that fit the verse until we got there and we walked my route and about halfway. I said, no, it's no good. It's not, it's not a very conducive way to walk the route to get there. And once you get into the park, I run out of verse. I can get myself into Zeidler Park, but once I get in there, I don't have any clues left for a dig spot. A lot of the verses are kind of, they all seem like they're made that way, that we have a general idea of where the city is. Then we have some instructions that you need to follow to get you to a spot inside of that city and then you have a couple of lines in the verse that are your very specific dig instructions so like you were saying rich there's a lot of ways that you can get to these places i the more that i've been working on it and walking the routes and being in Milwaukee and doing all those things i'm really came to the idea that byron price wasn't being super specific. He was getting you some pretty vague clues that probably fit a lot of things, but they're all going to get you to the same spot that he wants you to. It's once you get to that spot that you're really going to have to hunker down on your verse and on that painting, because all of the, all of them three that have been found, which isn't enough to make a pattern, but it's all we have to go on. Each painting has had the dig site in the painting. So you would think that you have to get real specific in your verse and then go to your painting and try to put those things together. So I think the verse is laid out pretty vague to get you to a general location and then real specific. And with my Zeidler park solve that I had, I found out quickly once we got to that park that there was nothing else to go on. And I had spent all of my time on the computer mapping out something to make it fit within the verse only to come up snake eyes because once you are there and you're walking it, it's a much different experience, but being able to divorce myself from that, 
I was able to take other things that Rich and Jake have had and my friend at work, and we were able to take that failure that I had and get some knowledge out of it. And that's kind of the important thing is that anytime you do mess up, take all that stuff that you didn't do right. And now you know not to do that again. And that's very valuable. I I agree a hundred percent. And I went with you guys on the walking tour of the last location that we're, we were looking for, and it was very eye-opening to me. Actually, I I was surprised with what we found and what we didn't find mm-hmm. to this to date. Anyway, I'm not going to go into too many details there. What's next for for you? Um, do you dig? Do you just grab a shovel and go start digging, or or nobody grab what, a shovel? What, what do you have to do next? If don't do if that, you think you know where it's at. <laughs> don't do um, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't do that. Anybody who's listening, don't grab a shovel and start digging. <laughs> with that, don't do it. Um, Milwaukee, the city of Milwaukee has actually been very clear about this. Um, thanks oh. Josh Gates that <laughs> because of that people have taken to go into the parks and digging, people aren't filling in their holes. So Milwaukee finally put the kibosh on it and said, no digging without a permit. You can't do that. And anything that you do recover from the ground is property of Milwaukee. So, wow. So, <laughs> <laughs> Which there's a little it, obstacle it, there. Yeah, there's a little bit of a problem there. Um, one, they're not giving out, they're not giving you a permit to dig for it. They're not going to. So it really puts you between a rock and a hard place. So the way that you almost have to go about it at this point is we have to refine our solve and um elaborate on what Jake already has and we kind of fill it in with our pictures and all the things that we found. And we try to get that to expedition unknown is basically mm-hmm. kind of the spot that everybody's been boxed into, which is fine with me. Um, but that's kind of the step that you almost have to take now is we have to get it there somehow and then hope that some producer reads it and says, Hey, this is different than what we've heard. Um Milwaukee seems to be negotiable on the no digging once a film crew is involved. So that's almost the way that you have to go. Um, so unfortunately you just can't go dig, which makes uh, it. Even- I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think Jake actually was to a point where he did send something off to publisher, I believe. And yeah. to, to let them know, I mean, he followed some type of instructions that are in the book for if you are unable to dig, um, do you know if he got a response back from anybody there? So, yeah, he did get a response back. And the if you open to the back of the book, it will actually give you those instructions that if you are unable uh, to get to the location to dig it up or you go there and you dig and it's not there, you can write to this address. You can explain your solve where you think it is. And if you're correct, they will send you the gem. You don't get the cast or the key, which is unfortunate but you do get the gem. So Jake did that. He followed all those instructions and he did get a a response back quickly, by the way. Um, And the publisher said that they are no longer um, in control of the gems or the game in order to award any prizes or have the solves. That's all with Byron Price's widow. So that's, they're kind of removed from it. However, they did, they did say that they took his name and um, the solve and they said that they keep that on record. So that way, if we do find it, they know that we did contact them already. So they know how, because they do want to put out a new copy of the book to have the people that have found the treasures in the book to be able to kind of tell a little bit of their story. So the publishers did get back to Jake, which felt nice that they got back promptly and let us know what the status of that is. Right. Cause they could just ghosted him and said, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, I mean, so it's I nice s- that yeah. something like that, you know, they at least contacted him back. That's great. Yeah. I thought that was good. So essentially the author has since passed since he wrote this book. And Correct. from what you're saying, the widow is um, in, con- she's still alive in control of this. Is there any kind of trust or something that she's going to hand the reins over to or attorneys or something with the estate that, they can continue to tell people, yes, you're right. I mean, how do you find out if you're right? Um, um, see, 
I, I don't know if they have any trust set up or any of those things because, um, again, according to the painter, JPP, he said uh, in an interview maybe in 2014, I think I may have come across it online, that she didn't have anything to do with it, that Byron, Byron Price's widow had nothing to do with it. It was the publisher. So it was kind of conflicting information. But we do know from Expedition Unknown that she is, in fact, the custodian of the gems and all of that. So, like, I don't think that anybody has the ability to have the actual solves that Byron Price had. I don't think anybody has those. So, oh, they did say that in the email. That was an important piece of the email that they uh, sent Jake, um, is that the only way to get the gem now, you have to have the key. So if you just have a location and you were to write in, it's not going to mean anything. The only way to do it is you have, because I don't think anybody knows the exact locations to know for sure. So you have to have that key that is inside the cast that that's buried to be awarded finding it. Um, so yeah, so the real way to go through it again, seems to be going through an expedition unknown. I mean, yeah, we know somebody that already is in, in right. We know that in 2019, that's how the Boston one was actually found. The person who thought they knew where it was, there was construction going on at the baseball diamond where it was buried. He saw that and thought, oh, no, I think this is where it is. It's going to be destroyed. Uh, he was able to get in contact with the construction company and let them know of the situation. If they find anything, you know, interesting to let them know. And they did find something, a, a piece of the cask. And he took a picture of it and he sent it to Expedition Unknown. And that's how they were able that's to nice. find out about it. So the good thing is, is that the people over at Ex Expedition Unknown are clearly opening up mail. Otherwise, I never would have seen that. Right. So we know that it worked there. So it seems to be that's, again, that's kind of the gatekeeper now of the whole game is you have to go through there, which yeah. is fine for us because it's Josh Gates. Um, <laughs> but, you, but you just have to hope that they, they get the message and that it's interesting and different enough from what they'd probably normally get to right. have an interest in something. So the, so the publisher, so I guess I'm wondering, like, if you can't dig, if you're unable to dig, let's say, you know, you can't get Josh Gates involved, can't get the city to really give you a dig permit. If you contact either the publisher or the custodian of, of like, you know, the whereabouts, because the exact location, I guess you said, isn't known. I mean, can they tell you close? No cigar. Like, you know, we can't give you the gem because you don't have the key, but you're, pretty much in that area where it's supposed to be do you know if they'll tell you that no they're not going to give any such not hints that. or clues or this is so no, cruel they're not, <laughs> they're not giving anything because honestly they just don't know i mean people at least one person tried creating a fake in san francisco and oh. flies back to italy or wherever they were from and claims that they found it and it's another one of those situations where Expedition Unknown is there to go follow up on this because they've been following the whole secret story. And exactly. thanks to that, they were able to tell relatively quickly that it was a forgery. It wasn't real. So the only way, the only real way to know that you legitimately found this is to have that key that they know um, is an authentic key. There's right. things on there that they know to look for that this right. is authentic. And that artist is still alive. And I think they checked with her with the San Francisco fake. Yep. Camp, and she yep. was able to say, yes, I, I never made that. Right. So because of the passage of time and the unfortunate death of Byron Price, we're in a situation where you don't get any national treasury or Da Vinci Cody more than this, where right. there, there is no safety net. There is no clues. There isn't any of that stuff. There's an, a, uh, the risk of, you know, getting in trouble by authorities. If you really get adventurous and you want to do that, like there's, there's a lot to this particular treasure hunt that kind of makes it feel different than geocaching or other things that right. people do today. Well, we're looking at almost 40 years, you know, I yeah. mean, what is the, what is the likelihood that all of them could be found? I mean, the one that was found recently, it was, you know, 
almost destroyed. I mean, I'm I'm not sure how many could be found, but it's pretty exciting if anybody else were to yeah. find them. Yep. That's yep. one of the problems is that things change over the course of 40 years. How much, so that goes with what location you think he would have put it at. Was, did he put it at places that he thought would be relatively safe that would stand the passage of some time? But even he couldn't have guessed it would have been 40 years. Right. So it's one of those other things that when you're looking in your city, if you're from there or you have a lot more detailed knowledge, you might know some of the things that have changed that this wasn't there before. So I know that this is different, you know? So there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of problems that pop up to make it an easy game. It's not easy by any stretch of the imagination. Now, once you think you figure a puzzle out, it makes a little bit more sense and it seems a little bit more simple, but I've caught myself recently saying it can't be that easy. Right. But I think it actually was. Yeah, I mean, it could be, like I said, reverting <laughs> back to who the books were written for. You know, right. like sometimes we can make things more complicated and kids yeah, exactly. can take a look at things and they're just like, oh, yeah, it's that it's really easy. Exactly. It's real um, easy to overthink things. And yeah, yeah, it's really um, easy. So and what I want to say is like, so I was diving into this the last couple of weeks since we like, you know, firmed up the schedule of having mm -hmm. Brian on mm -hmm. and taking a look at things. So I do want to send you guys, I won't mention it here. I'm going to send you an email, Rich, forward it on over to Brian, because I came up with us whenever you were talking about and you brought up um, Zeidler Park, I was actually mm -hmm. like, that was the first place that I went to when talking about when Rich had mentioned about the 200 and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I went down that rabbit hole a little bit. And then I found out about some connections with that name, with things, with locations that have actually been relocated. So I don't know oh, if you've heard of that. <laughs> so I am going to send you the link. Well, there goes that now. <laughs> I feel like. You better hope it, something isn't in one particular place where I really, really want it to be because that would make me feel very good. <laughs> so I'm going to send this link because I just, like I said, I, you guys have been working on it for so long, but I just, I dove down this rabbit hole so much in the last two weeks and I had a wedding reception to plan for and everything. And I just could not stop, <laughs> stop looking at things. So now I'm not boots on the ground, but it's just information. So I'd love to pass it along to you um, just to sure. see if you guys have discussed that or talked about it. So sure. Um, I'm hoping like maybe we can have you back on again to discuss this a little further. Sure. Uh, yeah, more information. Absolutely. Maybe you could be our conspiracy theory expert. <laughs> oh, I would love to do that. Because, <laughs> yes, we can go. We can go down all of them. It'd be fun. All the, all the rabbit holes. <laughs> just give them to me. <laughs> well, Brian, I appreciate you coming on and and talking with us. I mean, I think it's been great. Um, yeah. Hopefully, listen, listeners enjoyed it. Um, I certainly. Hey, well, let's not delight. Come on. I mean, I could sit here. I could sit here for hours and, you know, and right? go yeah. over this. I mean, treasure hunt. Just, you know, Gem. <laughs> it's it, like we just. Uh, I'm going to put down just, all the hashtags on this mystery. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been great. So I, I just thank you for coming, taking some time out, and coming and sitting and talking with, with us on here on the realm. Um, Thanks again, Brian and Jenny. It was so good to see you today. Good Brian. to be here. Yep. Good Thanks, to be here. Engineer. On here. Yeah, yeah, my beer. beer. Yeah, I was just drinking water because I had a I, I I was okay yesterday. I just need to let my body recover. <laughs> <laughs> um, so guys, just so you know, we have an exciting month coming up in October, like we mentioned in the beginning. So keep checking back and uh welcome back again to season two. Rich, Jenny, Brian, so nice to see you guys. Yeah, nice seeing everyone. Stay weird, everybody. Ciao. Bye. 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 Yeah.